So uh, let's get started. I'm pleased to welcome our first speaker, Andreas Hertz. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, to be remembered, to be part of the family. Uh, John was speaking, Carlos was speaking, David is inviting. And um, many memories for me from the times I was at Caltech from 90 to 93. Uh, heavily overlapping with David, many memories from back then. But I think part of the family also means that there are all the memories from other periods following. Uh, I remember uh, David and Carlos and Mary and John coming to my wedding. Uh, and I also remember a couple years later, David visiting me in Berlin and uh, my two older kids, uh, at that time the two only kids were five and three at that time, and they just loved it to have a horse in the flat for about two hours. David, you know, I said, stop it, stop it, it's good enough. But he continued. They were riding one on him, both on him. They were struggling, you know, who was to get the pleasure to be close to David, as many of us are. And I will never, ever forget this scenery. I don't have pictures for that. You can imagine, two little girls and a strong horse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so I want to talk about some work uh, I've been doing recently with uh, Martin Stemmler, who in fact also came from the Caltech uh, Computational Neuroscience program, and Alexander Mattis, who was a PhD student in my group and is now at Harvard. And this will in some way connect to some things you've heard from John already, uh, it also deals with rats and mice, so it connects to Carlos's uh, topics. And at some point, I should say it would be nice if it would also connect more to David, and you'll see where that could be, and maybe there is some stuff. He had only talked about two projects he wanted to do in the next month, so maybe there is space for some more. All right, so um, if you think about how space is encoded uh, in the mammalian brain. Uh, if you ask this question some 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people would say, well, it's in the hippocampus. And John already alluded to place cells, so neurons that are active. If the animal and its path is shown in black, moving around uh, here a one by one meter box, and a particular uh, place cell will be active when the animal is in a particular region of that space. And there's not only one place cells, but many of them. And together, they call or they form um, a place map or a cognitive map. These neurons allow events to be attached to certain locations in space. And that's the story as it was some 10, 12 years ago until the Moses came along and found yet another class of neurons that are spatially modulated. But there, one neuron does not have a single firing field, but multiple ones that are arranged as a beautiful hexagon. And so the issue is, why are there two such systems in the brain, in fact, heavily connected with each other, and how is space encoded? And to address this question, let me show you some of the salient grid cell features. Um, if you record with a tetrode, and Carlos alluded to what tetrodes are, you get an extracellular signal from neurons nearby. If you record with such a tetrode in entorhinal cortex, that's where the grid cells are. And in this situation, you have three cells uh, whose firings are marked by blue, red, and uh, green. And if you mark the centers of these firing fields, that's shown here, you get uh, a pattern that becomes very simple to understand and easy if you shift the firing fields relative to each other. If you shift by the right amount, you can get them to perfectly match, which means that if you record with an, uh, such an electrode, uh, you get signals from nearby neurons, nearby in the cortical sheet. And apparently, these nearby cells have the same spatial frequency they have a similar orientation, but they differ in spatial phase. Now, 
if you record over larger distances in the entorhinal cortex, you'll see that the wavelengths, the spatial frequency that it increases, as you can see from here to here, depending on where you record in the entorhinal cortex. So it seems that there is a way to represent space. And in fact, the Nobel Prize in 2014 was given both to O'Keefe, who had found the place cells, and to the Mothers, uh, to Edward and Maybrit Mother, for their discovery of the grid cells. And the prize was given for the Mothers because it was argued that this constitutes a metric for space. And I want to show you how the argument goes. The idea is that if an animal runs along this line, then the neurons will fire here. They will again fire here, and once again over there. And so by measuring when they fire, you'll know how far the animal has advanced. For later use, I'll describe these firing fields by periodic generalizations of Gaussians in some way by van Mises tuning curves. And these are just cosine waves uh, in the exponent uh, of an exponential function. This is the way how we will characterize these tuning curves. And in fact, that's a pretty good characterization of the specifics of these tuning curves. So it makes sense to use this parameterization. Now, can this really be a metric for space? Nobody can force the animal to run on a straight line, uh, let alone a straight line in a particular direction. And if the poor rat or mouse happens to run in a different direction, it would not be able to use the distance between the firing fields as a measure because, as it's shown here, depending on the angle, the distances between two consecutive blobs is very different. And you know, maybe the rat even decides to run in circles, uh, coming back to the same location. And sure enough, then there is no way to use these neurons for a metric. So I believe that these big words, grid cells, single grid cells, are a metric for space, is a bit questionable, and that we should think about what can they really do and how can they do that. In fact, even worse, if you think about this uh, graph I had shown you before, that within one module, uh, grid cells are just shifted versions of each other, then if you are here, the activation pattern, even from a population of nearby grid cells, is indistinguishable from that if the animal is over here. So not only can it not use the grid cells for measuring distance, it can also not use it for determining where it is, at least up to this distances. So there is a problem with this notion. A single grid cell, grid cell module, i.e. a group of neurons with the same spatial scale, cannot be used to represent spatial location. And that also means that maybe we can do it if you combine across modules, but not a single module in isolation. And in some way, that's a puzzle, because if the grids were not arranged parallel to each other, but with certain angular shifts, one could decode location beautifully, because then each location in space would have a slightly different activation pattern for these grid cells. So why are the axes aligned? And you know, maybe a second question, why are there grid cells if we had already place cells? Or vice versa, why place cells if you also have grid cells? And uh, let me first address the second question briefly. Um, we can do this in a, in a playful manner. We can uh, use a, a fixed number of, of neurons, let's say 12 neurons, with tuning curves that are reminiscent of the place cells on the one hand, or grid cells on the other hand. So here they will be periodic, and they will come with different scale. And we can ask the question for the same total number of neurons, is it better to use place cells or is it better to use grid cells to encode space? And the way how we approach this is that we say, well, the animal is somewhere on a linear track. Uh, 
to make things simple, one-dimensional track. We can calculate based on the profiles of the activity and using a Poisson model as the most simple way of uh, describing the coding of position, we can calculate uh, what is the probability that at a certain position there is a certain spike count vector. We can then draw that. We can do a maximum likelihood estimator and calculate the estimated position and then compare the two. That gives us an error. And we can ask, is the error smaller if we use place cells or is it smaller if we use grid cells? And to make a long story short, if we use a place code, the error decreases like one over the, one over the number of neurons. And if we use a nested grid code, uh, that is a code where the spatial scales uh, scale in a geometric fashion, then the error scales exponentially. So if you have many neurons available, you're always better off using a grid code. And in fact, that's also intuitively understandable. If I play a simple game with you and I tell you, you know, you should give me numbers between 0 and 999, I could either give you a thousand cards where these numbers are written on, or I give you 30 cards with the tens, the hundreds, and the ones, and you have to show me a combination of three cards, that's the grid code, or you show me one of 1,000 cards, that's the place code. Things are a bit more complicated because neurons are noisy, but in principle, that's the explanation why a grid code is so much better than a place code. But this argument does give you the fact that it should scale in a geometric fashion, but it does not give you the scaling factor. Now, how is this related to reality? In fact, the Moses had published a paper some four years ago that shows that if you measure the scale ratios, the length of the largest scale uh, relative to the next one and so on, that these are indeed almost the same numbers. So it seems that in reality, the grids do form a geometric series. The number they get is something like 1.4. In the Moser and uh, in uh, O'Keefe's lab, it's more like 1.7. So I would not argue about uh, the second decimal, but I would say it's somewhere around 1.5. It would be nice to know why. Why 1.5 and why not 10, like in the decimal system? And in order to make progress uh, towards asking or answering such question, let's think about how to read such a code. So again, for simplicity, we assume that these are independent Poisson neurons. And uh, we can write down some quantity David has written down probably billion times the posterior, so the probability of being at a particular location given the spike count and assuming independence of these individual grid cells, we can give the formula. And what usually people would then do is they look for the most likely position, that's the maximum of the posterior, and they do maximum likelihood decoding. Now this expression in here is a bit complicated and it might not be that easy and implementable in neural hardware. And so the question is, can one actually calculate this quantity in an easier way? And at that point, so is there a biologically plausible alternative to do so? And at that point, the von Mises tuning curves come in handy. And I looked at David's book the other night, and yes, von Mises tuning curves are mentioned as periodic uh, generalization of Gaussians. But it's only a few lines there. And I think in the next edition, you should put a few more lines there. <laughs> because, so if we focus on a one-dimensional situation and only on the largest grid scales, and uh, so that's a posterior. And if you remember a little bit of high school mass, and I you know, just flash it, um, that's the defining property of an exponential function. And uh, you, you learned it for sure at high school. And maybe David or Sanjoy or somebody else made you work out this problem. 
uh, that if you uh, add two cosine waves or sine waves, and it's important that they have the same wavelengths, but otherwise, you know, the scaling both with the size, the amplitude, and also the phase is arbitrary. If you add two of those, you again get a cosine wave. And if you put these two formulas together, you'll notice that uh, the exponent of a cosine times the exponential function of a second cosine with the same wavelengths give you again an exponential of a cosine. So if you insert this into this formula, you'll realize that the posterior is also von Mises. And that's a beautiful property. It makes life very easy. And here I think that, you know, David, there should be a three-liner in the book because it's just so beautiful. Um, in addition, if you think about that, you, you would like to know the maximum. You want to do maximum likelihood decoding. And the maximum of that can, in fact, be calculated from a population vector decoding. So what I've shown here are the tuning curves of, I think, 20 such neurons. And uh, in a particular situation, let's say the animal is located here, uh, the <coughs> neurons along this line fire, this one, three spikes, that one, one, these two, two, and again, one. Uh, and if we now arrange these spike counts uh, around a, uh, a circle and look for the population vector, this would give us this maximum, and we know that it is von Mises, and we can calculate the widths, so we know that the posterior is like that. And I think we know it, but as this construction shows, a neural network could also know it. So it's a very simple way of calculating the posterior for such types of tuning curves. And in fact, this idea that multiple neurons encode different positions maximally, and then you do a population vector decoding is not new. It has been used, for example, in the cricket wind sensitive system to explain how this creature knows from which direction wind is approaching by superimposing the activity, in this case, of four neurons. Or by Georgopoulos in the motor system, where the direction of an arm movement can be predicted with high precision from measuring activity of uh, neurons that are, again, sensitive to certain directions. What's new now is that the stimulus space is not periodic anymore, but it's linear. Uh, that there are multiple scales in the grid system and that we are working in a two-dimensional stimulus space. But otherwise, the concept is very similar. So what that tells us is that we can combine, in fact, these different modules and adding each additional one allows us to get a better and better estimate for the true position. So this would then be the interpretation of the grid code, namely that on the largest scale, you have neurons that give you a rough estimate of where you are. And then with the shorter spatial scales, you get better and better to determine where you actually are. That's a framework. What are the predictions that come out of that? The first one is that grids should be aligned within a module. Remember when I showed you the mass, I needed that uh, the wavelengths of the different cosine waves are identical. In 2D, that means that the grids should not be rotated with respect to each other, but that they should be aligned, because then you have the same wavelengths in each of those. And so we can calculate this, uh, you know, what kind of deviation is tolerable, and within a module, it should be perfectly aligned. And across modules, uh, the mass does not really demand that they are exactly aligned, but we can do this numerical analysis and see that it's best to align them. And if you look at the experimental results, that seems to be true. What's shown here is grid orientation, grid spacing. These are data from one red, from a second red, and from a third red. So this is my favorite red, uh, where within each module, you know, it's really beautifully aligned. All these dots corresponding to one neuron each, uh, 
are exactly lined up and they are even lined up from module to module. Here it's a bit more blurry, but after all, that's biology. And as my PhD supervisor, Leo von Hemmen, once told me, you know, theory should never ever fit all facts. Because <laughs> then you overdo it. I don't know whether I fully agree, but I think it's a strong indication that indeed uh, the, the grids are aligned as would be predicted by this theory. What about the scale ratio? I mentioned that it's somewhere around 1.5. Why? And here the argument is, in fact, quite simple. If you have a single module, the log of the posterior is a cosine. So if the animal is at location zero, the most likely, or if it's here, it, the activity will be peaked at zero, but there might be some deviation. Now, you use the second module to make this estimate tighter. And sure enough, if you have a scale ratio of two, see the peak increases and it also gets more narrow. So you are more confident that you are really where you are. On the other hand, note these side lobes. So over here, the probability that in fact you believe that you are half a wavelength away from where you actually are, are has increased. So this increases the probability to make large scale errors. Whereas on the other hand, if you use a scale ratio of 1.5 or smaller, this cannot happen. Because here you are at the bottom of the next wave, so your, the probability to make this false guess does not increase. So it seems like a safe guess to do that and not shoot for a much better or much higher scale ratio. And three divided by two is not that far off from 1.4 or 1.7, so we were confident that maybe we captured an essence of the system here. And that's not only the, the only one a prediction that comes from that, but there is yet another one which could be tested and which the Moses will test, in fact. I was talking about these multiple modules. So if you take out the smallest module by some optogenetic method, what you would predict is that the resolution with which the animal can do its navigation gets a bit worse. If, on the other hand, you take out one of the intermediate modules, then between the remaining neighbors, you have a scale factor that is much larger than 1.5. In fact, it's close to 2. Then you would predict that in this situation, there is a higher likelihood that the animal does make one of these dramatic errors. The likelihood might still be small because, after all, I plotted the log of the posterior and not the posterior itself. So it may be that this is not happening very often. For the animal, however, it might be a truly bad situation if it misestimates its position by half a wavelength. That arguments I presented so far were mainly in 1D. What to do in higher dimensions, in 2D or even 3D. And here our, our bold proposal is that, well, what the system does in calculating positions is it just superimposes uh, estimates along three axes with 60 degrees. You could do it with two, but if you do it with three, you have an additional safety factor uh, by error correction. So far, I've been talking about a way of reading the grid cell activity to determine your position. Now, as John pointed out in his talk, animal wants to do more than just to know where it is, but it wants to go somewhere. How to do that within this framework? And here I, I take up uh, an old idea uh, that was also done uh, by Georgopoulos, namely mental rotation that we can, through some gain fields, rotate vectors, population vectors, in the brain and then do a coordinate transformation. This was done for the motor system, but we can do the same if we think about the grid cell system. So this is one of these unit areas in uh, the grid system, and I've 
plotted a number of neurons and color coded their activity. So at that very moment, the animal would think that it's located here. But now it may want to go either to this reward or to that nest. And to this end, it needs to know the direction from its current position to the goal. And this has to be done in egocentric coordinates. How can this be done? Well, if we multiply this grid representation by sine wave gratings, whose phase represent the goal position, then we can make a variable transformation from allocentric position to egocentric goal. And by this simple trick, the animal can then know goal direction to different goals, depending on these gain fields. And so the prediction would be that somewhere downstream of the entorhinal cortex, there are neurons that with sinusoidal spatial tuning that can, in fact, act as such gain fields and be used by the animal to know in which direction to go from its present position. Let me finally come back to information theory some way and ask the question, you know, why are there these beautiful hexagonal patterns? And one way to address this is using Fisher information. And in fact, what we could show is that in 2D, a hexagonal pattern is optimal and make predictions for 3D, for animals that move freely in 3D, like bats or maybe uh, some uh, aquatic mammals. And the prediction there would be that in such a situation, uh, you have an FCC or HCP packing. Now, this result might not come as a surprise because you would say, well, it's just a packing issue. And once you're there, that's in fact not a problem anymore. It's slightly more complicated to think about the fact that the different firing fields of different neurons overlap so that you have to first work out why there is this correspondence to uh, the closest packing problem. Finally, what about this issue of a metric for space? In fact, there was a paper uh, from the O'Keefe group about a year ago where they argued that if you put an animal in a highly elongated environment, such a trapezoid, the beautiful hexagonal shape of the firing patterns disappear. And this was used by uh, O'Keefe and collaborators as an argument against the grid patterns playing the role of a fundamental metric. What I tried to show you is that the metric is not identical to the hexagonal pattern. In fact, the hexagonal pattern of a single neuron does not provide a metric, as I tried to show with this simple cartoon early on. It is the population activity of different neurons with different spatial scales that establishes the metric. And after all, a metric is defined by some well-established mathematical properties and not simply by a beautiful color-coded pattern. If you work it out, what the theory that I presented to you predicts is that you could still have a metric readout even for the situation where the grid fields are distorted in an elliptic manner if all grid cells within one module are distorted in the same manner. And there are data, again, from the Moser group that suggest that indeed there are distortions, but they are such that they are shared between different grid cells in the same module. So it seems that this idea of having a population vector decoding from multiple modules does provide the animal with a metric representation of the physical space. And 
I would close by showing you some pictures from the hotel where Edward puts his guests. So they're beautiful hexagons, which also shows that hexagons can come about by many facts. So if we observe hexagons and have a theory why they should be hexagons, you know, that might be nice. But whether that's the truth or not, you will never ever be able to know. You, we can only falsify. And so this is the hallway, that's the room, and clearly the people in the hotel didn't get it right because the scale factor is far away from 1.5. <laughs> so that's the type of experiments you need to do to falsify a theory. This pattern is certainly not made to help you do spatial navigation within <laughs> the hotel. So come to the end. Uh, what I tried to show you is that at, at times there is a chance to come up with a very simple theory. Here it's population vector decoding that takes elements from thoughts developed much earlier in different fields, combine that, and make predictions to be tested in later experiments. There are many issues that are not settled within this framework, many issues that would require somebody with a deep mind, and therefore I'm, if I may say so, still optimistic that maybe you know, David and I can think about some of those and I can profit for your expertise because after all, you know, this is coding, this is decoding, this is base in a very simple manner, so probably it's too easy for you. <laughs> but nevertheless, maybe you'll give me some advice as you have done over all these 25 plus years we know each other. Thank you so much. Okay, we should have plenty of time for questions. I've got uh, two connected questions. Uh, my recollection is that the simple hippocampal place cells, many of them have the property that the phase of the spikes made by the cell relative to a clock rhythm in, in the brain uh, depends on location within the receptive field. So you can get extra fine resolution information from the mm -hmm. phase of the, That's uh, from true. the timing of the action potential. Yeah. So my two questions are pretty obvious. First, do the grid cells have the same property? Uh, is there evidence of, of that, that the, the timing of the action potentials matters? And then have you thought of including that in your, your model as a way of getting better Better yeah. resolution. Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, so yes, uh, they do show phase precession. And in fact, we have done an analysis of this phase precession of grid cells. Usually, phase precession is measured by averaging over runs, over trials, to get better statistical power. But this may lead to spurious effects. You know, it could be that on different runs, uh, the cells spike differently so that you get a phase precession in the average data, although there is none in the individual data. And, and so we had looked at this in detail, and in fact, phase precession at the single run level is even stronger than suggested by the average data. So it's more like this than like that. That's point one. Point two, no, so far we have, I would say, not yet uh, incorporated it, but uh, this might be a problem that uh, is of such a complexity uh, that it extends my capabilities but might be suitable to trigger some thoughts on your side. No, we had tried to stay simple here uh, and first to have a, a model that is you know, as simple as it gets but still has this predictive power. But yes, one should obviously uh, try to do that. Hi, uh, you, you talked about um, reading out the position from the population and you talked about um, calculating vectors places you want to go to. Have you got any ideas about how, what is actually generating this activity or how the animal would update it as it moves, update its position yeah. as it moves? So the idea is that there's input to the grid cell system from various sensory cues and also from self-motion cues and so that it can do what they call dead reckoning. Yeah. Um, the experiments 
I believe have, n with respect to grid cells, still need to show that by doing the experimental tests in complete darkness, remove olfactory cues. And people are working on that, but it's very, very difficult because you have to clean uh, the platform all the time. And so I think it's still an open issue whether it's really a self-motion integrating system that we see, whose results we see in the activity of the grid cells. But it's a crucial point to be explored for sure. Now, how does this come about? How is this activation pattern? Um, that in fact connects back to John's earlier work on attractor neural networks. And the current idea is that the grid cells form a continuous attractor network, i.e. one where this hexagonal pattern you saw on the single neuron level is shared, or if you plot the activity in a neural sheet, not in physical space, but in, in an abstract neural space, and if you have inhibitory couplings of the type Carlos was telling you about, that are arranged in a Mexican hat-like fashion, that this would allow for the creation of hexagonal patterns that then get the input from these readers, the speed or visual input, that shifts this activity pattern, a blob, many blobs, that shift this activity pattern around such that you, if you record from a single neuron, you would get these grid cell activity pattern. So they, that's what they call continuous attractor neural networks. Uh, Joram Burak and Ila Fiete have worked on this extensively. What I do not see yet is a nice, simple theory that would predict exactly these properties in the same way I think what we still miss is the Hopfield 84 paper. Uh, there are simulations, and it's tricky to move this activation pattern because what you want to have is that the activation pattern moves in exactly the same speed and direction as the animal moves with respect to the outer world because otherwise, very quickly, it would uh, you know, fade out and you would not see the nice activity blobs anymore. This has been done in simulations quite successfully. If you do the simulation, you have to fine tune parameters. And what's missing is somebody who does the emergent calculation, if I may put it that way, from single neuron activity to emergent large scale variables that actually move in exactly the same way as the system would require it to do. So there is something to be done for other people. Let's thank Andreas again. <laughs>